the final thing I would say on carbon fibre is something that's just, I think the industry is perhaps missing in its sort of headlong rush for this performance and sort of marketing advantage as much as anything. Um, and it's something that I feel doesn't sit enormously well with bikes uh, in terms of the fact that they're a very low impact form of transport. And it's the fact that um, carbon fibre is made from crude oil. It's made, the fibres themselves, the, the resins that, yeah, the composite resins, that, the, the epoxy resins that they make it out of, it's all petrochemical. It's all organic compounds. It's made out of oil. It's virtually unrecyclable. It's landfill after it's, after it's finished with. And just my personal opinion is that that doesn't sit very well with me in terms of what a bicycle is. Because the thing is, is that particularly with these very light structures, they're not long life. The thing about carbon fibre is that interestingly, you could make, if you made you know, these sort of crazy light bikes, if you made them 50% heavier, they'd still be lighter than most of, the, most of the things you could make out of metal. But they'd be virtually unlimited life. They'd last forever. Um, they'd be so strong and so you know, fatigue resistant. Um, and yet these guys are sort of using Formula One technology and you know, they're getting on a real adventure down there at the sort of less than a kilo kind of mark. Um, and they're making this stuff that will, you know, somebody will hit it or they'll drop it on a rock and then it'll delaminate and it'll crack and it'll be, it'll be landfill. You can't even burn it. It's, you know, so that's just something that I think is, uh, people are perhaps missing a little bit um, uh, with their excitement for something new and interesting. Aluminium. Uh, aluminium is the most prevalent material in use in cycling today. Um, there are a number of reasons for this. Uh, I mean, it started out in the early 90s as when it started to take market share as the new, you know, amazing aerospace material. Um, and there were some issues with it because it's not a particularly easy material to design for because it's, it's quite capricious when it comes to fatigue. Uh, and also it's very, very sensitive to how well you've heat treated it. However, the, once the quality and process issues were overcome, uh, all, its other, all its other attributes come to the fore. It's extremely easy to manipulate. So you can make these big, fancy, swoopy shapes that you see on a lot of bikes today, um, which, help it stand out on the, which help them stand out on the shop floor. Um, and as much as anything, you know, that, you know Mark, marketing drives a lot of this, you know, you've got to try and sell the bikes. Bikes have got to such a standard now that if it doesn't look good, why would someone buy it? It's, it, you know, it's as much fashion as it is engineering these days and that's a lot, that's a lot about it. Um, however, those big swoopy shapes can also be used to your advantage. You can, f you can begin to integrate components into it. You're beginning to see it now with uh, suspension bikes are beginning to have um, instead of having little CNC parts like on my hemlock here, um, things like that, that seat tube rocker where the, um, uh, oh no, I'm, not getting, I'm not getting a pointer up there, where that rocker is on the top right hand picture is attached to the seat tube, there's a CNC part welded to the seat tube there, um, on track bikes this year that CNC part is hydroformed into the seat tube, so you've, you've done away with the part, you've made you've done away with the process, so you've basically made the bike cheaper and lighter and easier to make. So people are beginning to use it rather than just purely in fashion terms to actually create you know, better, slicker, um, easier, cheaper to make things. Uh, there's two widespread groups of materials used in bicycles, 6000 series, 7000 series. 6000 series is the weaker of the two uh, and it's unbelievably soft in its raw grade. I mean, you, you, know, you can fold it with your hands. Um, but that means it is very, very formable and that's the ones where you'll see a lot of these hydroform shapes tend to be the 6000 series alloys. Um, however, its saving grace uh, as well as its formability is the fact that when you bring it up to T6 grade and you dip bath it and then you artificially age it, um, it comes up to a completely, it becomes a completely homogeneous structure. 
Um, there's virtually no issues around the welds in terms of the welds being a different strength to the main, uh, you know, to the main body of the tube and things like that. So, um, if, you, if designed for correctly, um, it can be a, you know, extremely robust material. Um, 7000 series generally aren't as formable, but they are stronger, uh, and they are, um, and things like 7005 is very common, but there's also an alloy called 7046, which is the strongest weldable uh, aluminium alloy, and you're seeing a lot of that now uh, around. <coughs> Reasonably formable, but uh, not quite as much as, uh, like I say, not quite as much as uh, 6000 series but doesn't require as much processing afterwards. It only requires artificial aging when you weld it. So you just bake it in an oven for about, I don't know, bake, take it up to about 400 degrees and then let it cool slowly over a couple of days. Um, the 7000 series alloys are the ones, that's the one I use for the hemlock. And because they are slightly stronger, um, the balance of strength against material, you know, a higher strength and being less reliant on material on the size of the sections makes it more a little bit more like steel to deal with the balance of the <coughs> strength versus the materials the, the, the actual section size of the uh, of the tubes that you're using is a little bit more on, in favour of you know material strength so it's why I like using it because I'm, I'm a little bit more comfortable <coughs> with that balance of properties. Um, where are we up to? Um, the final thing about seven, uh, final thing I'll say on 7000 series it does actually include the strongest uh, available aluminium alloy, 7, 7075. It's not weldable, um, but it is nearly the strength of chromoly. So you'll find a lot of machine parts, a lot of rocker pivots, a lot of forgings. They'll all be made out of um, high strength parts like that on high performance bikes because you can use um, very little of it. Um, Although you do have to again be careful, like I said earlier, because aluminium as a material is three times less this stiff than steel, once the strength gets up, it's all very well looking at your FEA plots and saying, oh, right, uh, that's, uh, you know, all the stresses all work out in that, you'll realise that the end of your rock is waggling around. Um, and I have done that. Um, <laughs> uh, so, yeah, you do have to be careful. These are, these are all the pitfalls that you can fall into. It's not just about stress, it's not just about the strength of the part, it's not just the fact that it all, you know, it's the right shape. It's that balance of strength, stiffness, um, load application. Um, you've just got to be, uh, you've got to be, sort of take a very sort of holistic approach whenever you change material, particularly if you're very comfortable with one particular material. Titanium. Once upon a time, uh, it's considered the ultimate material for to build a bicycle out of uh, before carbon fibre came to the fore. Um, in terms of uh, rigid frames, hardtail bikes like like so there, um, still very much the case for a lot of people. Um, it's a great material to build um, a hardtail frame out of. It's very high strength. Um, it's it's a little bit in the in the grades that we use for uh, for the soda. It's kind of somewhere between chromoly and 853 in terms of strength. Um, so with it being that strong, you can design it very much like like with steel. You know, you can use it in very similar wall thicknesses, very similar sections. But again, coming back to that whole thing about stiffness. Um, although titanium is half the weight of steel, which is one of the great things about it, you can build very light frames out of it compared to steel. Um, it's also about 60% of the stiffness. So, what you, if you did actually design a frame in titanium, which was exactly the same as the steel frame that you've just built, which is perfectly robust, it would hang together, it would not break, but man, would it be flexible. It, and again, it would come back to that whole thing I was saying about the 953 frame earlier. It would be very flexible. It wouldn't be confidence-inspiring. It would be very comfortable. Um, so what you have to do is try and balance those, um, those attributes. And I did very much have this issue on the soda. Um, this, this soda is the latest generation, but the first generation version um, was quite, quite a bit more flexible along the length of the frame. And it's actually that twisting stiffness and, the, and a lot to do with the top tube stiffness, which is the thing that gives frames.